Emily, good to have you on on a big day. Dow futures off 340. It's been a weak week. Is there anything on a macro level that you can point to that would suggest why we, you know, maybe it's just August, maybe it's taper, whatever it might be. What do you think why we have seen more selling the last few days? Well, you know, I think there was a correction that we had to expect at some point after the after the rising market we've seen for the last, you know, six plus months. So I don't think it's a surprise. Uh, I do think that part of the tapering had been priced in. So, uh, you know, actually, in some ways, I think it's it's surprising that the market isn't down even more. But in the grand scheme of things, we think that the you know the bear market is likely intact, and this is something something that you know is frankly expected. A correction. Yeah, we pointed out at the top of the show, Emily, we have before, we have not had a 5% drop on the S&P 500 going back to October of last year. So about, what, nine or 10 months without not even a correction, just kind of a, a minor sell-off. It looks like eh, maybe we're starting to get some of that right now. Would that be unhealthy in your view? We would consider it healthy. And I think part of what's been going on, and, and I may have mentioned this before, but you know, back in 2019, the volume of retail traders in the market was around 12%, and that more than doubled during the pandemic. So you have huge numbers of individual investors and retail investors that are, you know, quote unquote, buying the dip. So when you look at the day in June when broad markets were down 1%, you know, you saw retail investors pile into the market. And, you know, that the mon uh, money like that that comes into the market fast is also going to be, you know, is going to to leave fast. And so I think if we had an if we had a correction that was relatively extended, you could see that what I would call hot money, um, you know, pull out of the market and lead to finally a healthy extended correction of more than 5%. Yeah, the, maybe the hot money cooling off quick. I mean, you know, first, yes. what is it? First in, first out. It sounds like that's kind that of what you're right. thinking. From a sect, yeah, from a sector perspective, though, we, we've got a story. I don't want to give too much away on NVIDIA. Their quarter stock doing pretty well this morning, even as futures are in the red. You are a big believer in semiconductors. I cover oil and gas and energy, and you're telling me I need to stop because semiconductors, they're the new oil. Yes, we... Semiconductors are the new oil. And I, one of the things that we've seen, which actually concerns us as a possible long-term threat to global economic stability, is rising US-China tensions. And that's that is directly related to the global semiconductor shortage. And what you're seeing is a scrambling among, uh, among countries to stockpile. And the pandemic really led governments to realize that they needed self-sufficiency, not only with something like the vaccine, but with, with semiconductors, which are critical to technological self-sufficiency and development. So we've seen a real scramble uh, for, for various countries to be able to produce their own. And this overall, the semiconductor industry, we expect volumes, revenues to double by 2030. So it's going to be interesting to watch how that affects the sector overall. Uh, you know, the U.S. used to manufacture in terms of foundries. Back in 2000, we had about 25 percent of global manufacturing. That's dropped to about 12 percent. And when you look at high-end chips, semiconductors that are required for the most sophisticated technological processes, 90 percent of that is in Taiwan, which... Uh, I probably don't need to remind you, is still con not considered or recognized as a separate country by China. So those dynamics yeah. we need to watch carefully. And I think the sector in general is a good prospect for long-term growth.